Hello everybody, Patrick here with uh, this week's lecture on uh, Heidegger. So this week we are going to be talking about uh, another dimension of the later Heidegger's philosophy. We're going to be talking about Heidegger and language and uh, that is going to be largely based on this text uh, on the way to uh, language. Now in this text, uh, it's quite a short one, only about a hundred or so odd pages um, and it's, it's split up into a number of Heidegger's lectures. These lectures uh, particularly happened around about the uh, early 1950s. Uh, and uh, so there's three lectures in there. The one we're going to be focusing on mainly is The Way to Language. And the there's some, some other bits and bobs in there as well. There's also a, a dialogue with... Um, with I think a Japanese inquirer, which is worth a, which is an interesting one, which we might take a look at uh, as well. But uh, what I want to do this week is, I want to try and explain what Heidegger his co primary concerns are regarding language. I want to try and explain the theories of language that he's trying to overcome. Uh, again, also, I want to try and contextualize this a bit in terms of where Heidegger is talking about questions of nihilism and technology, because Heidegger on language is very much of a piece with some of the other things that we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks. Um, so in some sense, Heidegger thinks the question of language is related to the question concerning technology, and it's also related to the, to the question uh, concerning nihilism that so preoccupies Heidegger uh, throughout all of his work, really. Now, the material on uh, language is, yeah, and at the end I'm going to try and try and explain what Heidegger's theory of language are. Uh, Heidegger's theory of language is and try to explain, I suppose, what is his um, what is his positive account of language, if you could put it in those terms. Now, as we've uh, noticed, and probably uh, those of you who have been looking at Heidegger, even in being in time, the, the Heidegger's language is it's quite difficult to try and penetrate and try to get to a grasp of or comprehend and his later work, I think, was a uh, was very much a form of experimentation with language. I mean, even being in time still was a, t a type of experimentation in language. And he's you know he's trying to invent new concepts and try to invent a new grammar of language. And in some sense, traditional philosophical language is inadequate to the task of disclosing being in an appropriate way. And I think also for Heidegger, the move in the later work to more poetic language comes to a head in 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 in, in the question on language. Because if you read those those essays, you can definitely see a shift in tone or a shift in register in how Heidegger is expressing himself, and that manifests itself in two particular ways: his language is becoming one more poetic, and secondly, it's becoming a little bit more opaque, I suppose, or a little bit becoming a little bit more uh, mysterious. So we see these core terms that that, that are Heidegger has. So if sort of if you see the slide there, you see the uh, the, the phrase disprack spricked. And that that again we've it's kind of awkward to translate from the German, but it roughly means language speaks. So that's an odd thing to say. Why would in fact uh, language uh, speak? What why what is it you know, we're the ones who do the speaking. That's the the the, the conventional wisdom. We're the ones who speak. Whereas language is a medium, I don't know, that's how we think of it at least. And I think Heidegger is probably trying to confront that notion. In some sense, language says, or language makes manifest, or shows in a way that is, I guess, prior to the way we uh, normally think about language. And so we get all these different types of expressions, you know, like Dysprax, like language speaks, or as I said there, language is the house of being. And that's another interesting one. Language is the house of being in some sense, or as I'll say later, he says poetically man dwells. And in some sense, what he's trying to drive at there is that we need to try and come to a realer or a more real, perhaps, or authentic understanding of how language operates than we have allowed ourselves to, to do. 
Um, the other thing I'd like to draw your uh, attention to there is the title of the book, of, of that collection of essays on the way to language. And I think that uh, reveals something about what Heidegger is uh, talking about. When he says the word way is interesting, way implies, well, it implies an opening, it implies a lack of impediment, or it implies uh, a direction, or it implies that you are between points. And in some sense, that's what Heidegger is trying to articulate when he says language speaks. What language speaks is that the transitive dimension of human being or the temporal dimension of human being. That what language unveils is the human beings who are on the way to something. They're, they are somewhere, they're from somewhere and they're going somewhere. So again, it's, it's, it is of a piece with the material we studied in being in time. At in some sense, what 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 language is doing, sort of meaningful, authentic language. What it's doing is articulating truthfully what that 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 dimension of human being, that sort of temporal dimension of human being, or sort of or Dasein, if you like, you know, the sort of historical Dasein as the intersection between a past and a present and a future. And in some sense, language, as I said, there is uh, proximate with being. Now, the other point I have there is that language is not located in consciousness. Now, I'm going to explain that a little bit uh, as I go along. But the basic point that you have to try and understand for now is that Heidegger is arguing that, you know, language is not something that is self-inaugurated. It's not something that I create. It's not something that I own or can have a sense of propriety over you know I, in some sense nobody owns language I think that would be the sentiment that Heidegger is trying to articulate or nobody creates language only themselves um, and I think what what he's driving at in a sense is that he's, he's trying to undermine the 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 subject object distinction that we've been studying for uh, quite a while. I mean that is the phenomenological spirit that we saw with Heidegger's interpretation of Husserl, uh, and how sort of Husserl is still embedded in in Heidegger. That you know that the human being is not located in consciousness, and in some sense language is the thing which uh, shows that or it manifests that for us because language is not located in you know language is very much of the world language is pertaining to our being in the world and to the pr practical tasks excuse me the practical tasks that we in engage in and there is that is now i think with modern technology that is in some sense being uh, challenged uh, for 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 heidegger i also say there at the bottom that language is not just psychology but that is that what i mean by that is that it's it's you know you you you, you for heidegger offering a, a say a psycholinguistic account of language you know that that uh, you know that we have an innate concept of language or innate structures of language that would be somewhat to uh, to miss the point and i think you know probably the main advocate of that would be uh, someone like noam chomsky who's got a, an innate uh, or sort of generative theory of grammar i think it's called or something to that effect and he and he's he's arguing that our sort of linguistic ac acquisition is defined sort of predefined if you like you know sort of the way, uh, the way we we have the deep structures in conscious which allow us to acquire language from a very young age onwards. Now that may or may well not be the case, but for Heidegger, it's only a very very small part of how language functions. So language, you know, Heidegger is a phenomenologist. Language is not something that can be explained in purely psychological terms. So if you could try and hold those ideas as we go through this, and I'll try and explain them a little bit further. Now, Heidegger, in his writings on language, in his reflections on language, he is trying to undermine a long philosophical tradition. Um, and that is the idea, as I said already, that language is focused on, or explanations or theories of language are focused on subjects representing objects. So a subject, a self or an object and thing out in the world, 
but the 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 the, the key word there would be uh, i guess to represent to represent an object in the world to the mind where we where the sole function of language is about abstracting information from the external world mediating it through the senses and presenting it in i don't know in in in, in image form are in, uh, in 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 terms of internal monologue, say you know the internal monologue that we all probably have in some shape or form, and that's interesting enough that I say that in some shape or form because the way people think, you know, cognitively at least, you know, it's not necessarily we don't necessarily think in words, we don't necessarily just think in words. Some of us think in images, some of us think in sounds, and I think that's what Heidegger is anxious about with the his, his more historical uh, notions of language. Now, the thing um, that's interesting is that, you know, Heidegger is writing, you know, from, I suppose he's doing philosophy from the, from the, uh, the, 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 the early 1900s onwards, I suppose. Um, and in that time, you know, in Austria, in Britain, analytic philosophy was coming into the ascendancy. We had the, um, you know, we had people like uh, Russell and Carnap and and uh, the sort of the great thinkers from the Frank or not the Frankfurt School, from the Vienna Circle. Um, so you know, people like Frege, for example, would be useful there to think about. And Frege, uh, his analytic philosophy was premised on propositions propositions about what what well, he was trying to figure out what what constituted a meaningless or a, or a meaningful or a meaningless uh, proposition and in some sense that came down to the question of sense and reference in some sense uh, any sense or meaning that we thought if it was meaningful or if it was not meaningful was premised on whether it had a, a referent in the uh, external world and that's why I have the on the slide there, I've got uh, word, image, and thing, and that is what Heidegger is, uh, or Heidegger thinks that's a pretty is, thinks it's a pretty limited or simplistic way of thinking about language. And then, but in another sense, it's right. You know, there is a sort of a very banal sense that we that we we you know when we when we think in a linguistic way, we attach uh, a concept or a word or an image to an object. Uh, uh, out there in the world well i think for, for heidegger that approach to the philosophy of language is um is a very very uh very very diminished i suppose account of what language ought to be about you know uh, and ultimately for heidegger there it's i think that type of language analytic philosophy or the early analytic philosophy of language what it's what it's what it's limited to is uh, a type of a technological language uh, you know it's 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 language stripped of its uh, of its practical function or it's, uh, you or its language uh, stripped of the practical context which animate it which animate the uh, animate the language which which makes it work um i'm trying to think of an example offhand i don't know maybe like um you know, if you think of like say something like a plane or an aeroplane or something like that, the language that goes into the schematics of it is within its own context very, very meaningful and very, very specific. And you're, you're damn sure when you're flying, you want those uh, schematics to be have been done well and professionally or, or or whatever. But on the other hand, it doesn't that the schematics doesn't give us an account of the. Uh, of the to say the lived experience of going on an aeroplane, and what all of the things that that's that entails, and I think that's more the sense of language that Heidegger is trying to uh, articulate. And I think uh, maybe another example might I don't know if you're like baking a cake or something like that. You know, and the eating of the cake is not you're not going to eat the recipe for the cake, I suppose. Now, the broader question then for Heidegger with regard. The question of language, I suppose, is that is it is uh, it is becoming language. He says is going to become more technological, or that that thing that we were talking about when we were discussing the question concerning technology, and that thing is the 
Like the sense that language is becoming more technologized, it's becoming part of uh, Das Gestell, it's becoming more and more part of um, that sense of networked thinking that we were uh, discussing uh, last week. And for Heidegger, language is becoming quantified or is becoming more and more mechanized in some sense. And what that what's that's doing, I think, for Heidegger is it's making language well more and more uh, I suppose specialized, more and more fragmented. And it's uh, as I say there, it's 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 making language uh, more and more neutral more and more neutral, more and more disinterested or, or, or abstract. And of course, the question technology is about what are, you know, for Heidegger, what is the, what is the, what is modern technology doing? It's bringing about a metaphysical transformation in the human being. And I suppose language, what's been happening to language would be a symptom of that. And ultimately, what we're getting is we're getting a, a very, very, sort of mechanized language we're getting more and more language which is neutral again neutral and abstract and disinterested and uh, disinterested and that's an interesting word disinterested um if you the, it's, it's it's i suppose it's the negation of the term interested and what's interested being interested if you if, if you go back to its i'm guessing its latin roots is uh, interesse um interesse you know, so it, it be, you know, inter between and essay essences between it's between things, right? And you know, you know, it's 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 involved. It's you're in the midst of things. You're 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 concerned and practically attuned and engaged with things of the world. And disinterested language then would be language which is uh, is abstract. It's abstracted from practical, concrete, everyday life. And it's 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 operating in a way that is immediate, rather than uh, immediate, I suppose. All right. Now, for Heidegger, I suppose modern uh, technology is. I suppose what's happening there is that it's in some sense becoming less authentic or less real. Less. I, I use the word less because. I don't think Heidegger goes so far as to say that, you know, so if we think of some of the examples of uh, abstract or mechanized language, I mean, I have I have an example there of, uh, say, text messaging or, or, or Skype language or emojis or something like that. But they're, in some sense, very, very, they're very, very, well, for Heidegger, they're ultimately, in some sense, meaningless. They're all part of the, 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 the idle chatter which uh, which which distracts us from fundamental questions of being, um, and I guess for Heidegger as well, it's while those things are 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 there, you know, they're not unreal. It's not he's not saying they just don't exist. Like you know, say say something like corporate language, say words like networking or synergy or <laughs> disruptive innovation or any of these these terms which we use to govern say our professional lives or our working lives they're not uh, they're in some sense they're 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 always in some way empty i think for heidegger there's something empty about them you know say someone might use the word going forward i probably use it myself in lectures and things like that this is a convenient way of of, uh, of 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 explaining what comes next, but in, in in another in another sense, then it's not about anything. It doesn't matter in a way. And for either we all kind of know that. We all kind of know those words when we hear them. You know, those like say corporate words or 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 or, or, or whatever, like synergy or something like that. Right? It's those the the they, they do kind of refer to something, something, but. In another sense, they're a somewhat cheaper divide of meaning for Heidegger. And that's what he's concerned about. So the question concerning technology is also a question concerning language. The language is losing its capacity to be authentic or to be real or to help us understand our historical position or our meaningful sense of language that we might 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 get some. That's his concern, that language is uh, reflects in framing. Das Gestell, you know, networked, 
network thinking. Now, if you look at the picture that I have there, I think that gentleman there is um, is is uh, I think is a member of the Native American Blackfoot tribe, I think, and uh, he was being uh, recorded for that picture. And in some sense, I think that encapsulates what Heidegger's concern is that we have we have this desire to to store the language that we use to try and turning it into a standing reserve. So take that gentleman's language or his dialect and, you know, store it in a museum somewhere or store it as an audio sound somewhere for, I don't know, for future generations to, to, to turn to. Now, some people might argue that that's, that's a very, very good thing. You know, you don't, you don't want to lose language like that. Still, though, uh, the, um, the 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 very act of recording, in some sense, creates a distance between the activity that that gentleman did in his life and the practical tasks which concerned him, and how the language is being stored. Now that temptation is there for, for us. We always have this, in some sense, desire to master language, to dominate it. Language is there to be inframed, to be owned, uh, to be stored. Um, the other examples I've there is I don't know I mean you you probably be better to place to understand that maybe we can talk about the seminar, you know things like instant messaging, text messaging, social media talk, or you know WhatsApp groups, whatever all of those types of speech. So it's not that they are not forms of communication; they certainly are. They certainly are. But Heidegger's concern is that when we are using them. Are we actually saying anything? Are we actually saying something? Or are we just amplifying our proliferating meaningless idle chatter? And the other point there is that, again, it's the question of ownership, the ownership of language. The language for Heidegger is, I suppose, you know, we, we, we allow language to be just thought of in functional terms. We allow language just to be thought of in, in functional terms, just as something instrumental, just as something that is devoted to particular tasks. And we take that, we take that paradigm or that model and it it, it transforms our thinking. It changes our thinking and, and to, to such a degree that we can no longer understand what we are actually saying or how we can listen to somebody else. Right. Um, we get it in the everyday uh, English phrase, you know, talk is cheap. You know, you know, how often do we hear people talk and they're not actually saying anything? How often do we do people, uh, you know, rabbit on, as we say in English, without without saying anything of note or anything significant or consequential? And I think that's that's what Heidegger's term is, is that what we're doing is we're going to engage in these technological innovations, which transform how we speak to each other and they transform uh, it to such a degree that it obscures things which are important or things which matter. So if I move on here and this is a quote um, so uh, we act as though we were the shaper and master of language while in fact language remains the master of man. So what is he what is he what is he what is he saying by that there? I think uh, the, the points I've I just I've got covered already the points I've got on this uh, on on this frame um, already on, or on this slide already. So we, we so I think there's a simple sort of reversal going on there, whereas we might think that in some sense humans are the origin of language, and in some sense we are. That is true, um, but I think what Heidegger's worried about or concerned about is that we. We think that we own the language we use. We think that we have a sense of propriety over it or that we have a sense of possession of it, that we dominate it. In the same sense that we, that we were talking last about, that we dominate uh, nature or, or, or dominate being. And um, that, 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 that quote gives us a sense of what Heidegger is driving, driving at. And in some sense, we don't own language at all. And we think we do, uh, you know, we think we think we think that you know when we when we're speaking, we don't really when we're speaking, we don't really think about the speaking. 
we don't think what we're saying or we don't think about our speech acts you know we don't like go okay i'm going to say this i'm going to say that but in the in the actual act of communicating with others in in speech acts or in expression artistic expression or in writing or whatever we think in some way that we are the 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 the, the that we control language in some sense, that it's that it's that it's ours, that it's proximate to ourselves, to our inner world. And in a sense for Heidegger, this is not the case. This is not at all the case. Because we don't own language. And if you think about it, if you think about it, like, you know, from from a from being a child onwards, you know, you don't own the language that you acquire. You know? Any of the words that I'm saying in this very moment are not mine. I didn't invent them. You didn't invent them. And in some sense, they speak, they come from, well, what do they come from? They come from a tradition, they come from our history, they come from a long line of trial and error, if you want to think of it in evolutionary terms. But we didn't really invent them. They are not ours, right? And I suppose what he's, what he's, what he's, what he's, what he's trying to say is that if we can think of language in that way, I think the word he talks a lot about this in, in, in the essays on language, he talks about the idea of language as a, a gift, you know, as language is, is skipped, it's like, it has a givenness to us. Language is given to us. It's, it's prior to our own comprehension, even. It's prior to our own understanding. And that, that, that sort of prior historicality of language shapes us, informs us, allows us to navigate our way in the world. It orients us, orientates us, you know, and it gives us uh, a sense of possibility or it gives us a means by which we can navigate where we are, where we, where we come from, and where we're going. Okay, and again, I have the example of corporate speak there. You know, like networking and operational strategies and all the rest of it, which I'm sure we've all kind of come across and will come across in the future. But those that type of language, in some sense, for Heidegger, is very, 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 very narrow. You know, there's very little at stake, although it masquerades as having everything at stake. Okay, now I just want to, uh, in order to try and begin to think then about, so I've tried to explain thus far what, what Heidegger is concerned about and what he thinks language is not, but what I want to try and talk about now is, you know, what's his, okay, so what then is language? How does language uh, work? Now, in Being in Time, you can't really say that Being in Time per se is a sort of a discourse on language, you know, uh, although we can see, get a sense of it. Um, as I said there, as I said already, in being in time, you know, he doesn't talk about language in the sense that he might talk about anxiety or authenticity or conscience or tool being or all of those things. But we do get a sense of, from being in time, how Heidegger's discourse and language can, starts to be formulated. So the word I've thought put there is that, you know, the idea of Gewohenheit or, you know, we were, you know, the idea, we talked about it a couple of weeks back when we were talking about Heidegger, the idea of thrownness, the idea that Dasein finds itself in particular situations and finds itself in those particular situations prior to our cognitive attempts to understand where we are. Right? And so in a sense, you can say the same about language. In some sense, we are thrown into language. So, so thrown is also, so it's like Wohen, so it's like Wohen is like to dwell. So in some sense, we inhabit language and that might, that, I mean, that that's probably, uh, uh, that's probably, that inflection is probably, as I said it there, is probably governed by uh, how we speak English. We say we inhabit language. In another sense, Heidegger would be saying it's more reverse as language inhabits us. You know, we are inhabited by different linguistic patterns, different linguistic traditions, different linguistic idioms. And language is part of that, it's part of our historicity, right, our historicity. It's not at all something, we can, and this is the theme of being in time, of course, is language is not self-inaugurated, as I say there at the bottom of the slides. And when I say self-inaugurated, I mean it's not something that is self-devised. It might be sort of quite a counterintuitive uh, idea that, you know, cause, because we always... When we when we use language, we always, in some sense, think it's proximate to our our, our thinking. It's, it's 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 something that we that we own, and um, that I think is where we can begin to think about Heidegger's uh, positive con concept of language, 
So it's like they, when I say they're at the top, their language is not just informational transference. Um, I think uh, it is, uh, by that I mean it's not just a means of uh, transmitting information, right? And in some sense we think of that. Say we look at, a, if we're, I don't know, if we're driving, you know, you might see a road sign or something like that and it says, I don't know, whatever, roundabout ahead or, or you know, 50 mile zone or whatever. Um, you know, uh, language can be used for that, certainly, and that's very, very practical and useful. You know, we need to know there's a roundabout ahead or we need to know that we should uh, give right away or whatever. But it's not just what language does. In some sense, language is more is that, but it's also much more important than that for Heidegger. We shouldn't be just reducing it to inform, information uh, transference. I think another example of, that, of of language is information transference would be just something like, I don't know, say if you're writing an essay and you just you just uh, say you plagiarize an essay, which none of you will be doing, of course, because you're all you're all very very good. Um, but say you plagiarise an essay. Say you, 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 as is often I've seen, people go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and they put in, they, 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 they take a, a load of signs off the, off the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy webpage and then they dump it into an essay, right? So information has been transferred there, but there's no authentic meaning or understanding of the information that has been transferred. So I think that would be another example of it. So what language is then is, has to be about... Uh, it has to be more about real, concrete, practical tasks. That's what it has to be revealing. And uh, it is something that is specifically human, I think, for Heidegger. You know, he does, I think, think there's a sort of a hierarchy between us and, and, and other beings, and language is one of the ways that we do that. You know, you know he always famously says that the animal is poor in world and the stone is poorer in world and the human is sort of being in the world and uh, in a sense language is one of the things that helps us uh, navigate our way around the world uh, it, uh, it's the thing which makes us distingu distinctively human and I think Aristotle is probably not necessarily Aristotle's um, you know theory of language per se but more Aristotle's understanding of what the human being is. And Aristotle says it, oh gosh, where is it? I think it's in the metaphysics. Um, it's in the metaphysics of physics. I'm going to go say, say the metaphysics. But it says, uh, what does he say? Zuon logon ekon. Right, and that is where we are at. The uh, zuon, uh, zuon is animals, like zoology, logon, logos, discourse, uh, ekon. Right, so the, uh, the human being is the animal that discourse is right and that is crucial it's profound it's, it's hugely significant for explaining who we are what we are where we're going and what is of concern and what matters to us so thus that tells us then that language if it is to be meaningful has to have a world disclosing function and all I mean by that in the same way that art does I suppose for Heidegger it has to reveal a world or has to show a world in some way it has to show a world truthfully as, as it's occurring in the process of occurring it has to be uh, and in that sense it's very very practical it has to be concrete embedded in the world enmeshed in in uh, our life right so language has to have a, a world disclosing function. Now, if you go, if we think back, that's why I keep going. I, I, I realize I, I keep talking about what Heidegger thinks language is not, but it is important. You know, like when I was talking about the, that sort of corporate speak, like you know, networking and synergies and all those, they don't really dis they reveal anything. They, they, I mean, that language could be as useful in an educational context as, say, in a, a hospital context, or as in a business context, or indeed even beyond that. You know, these sort of meaningless words are, are 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 can can be used anywhere, but they don't reveal anything particular about important about uh, what's immediately happening or immediately of what is at stake uh, for uh, human beings in in the world. So, language has to have a world disclosing function, and that's really important uh, for Heidegger. Language is never just Never, language is never just its material symbols, right? You know, you could explain language. Say you could explain 
you know, language is a very broad thing. You could explain language just in terms of, you know, you say, say you could explain a speech act in terms of, say, I don't know, in terms of sound and air and a sonic function, right? But it's never just a matter of hearing noises for Heidegger. You know, language, so you hear a sound, you hear a word, I don't know, say, like God, right? That word, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to have any reference, right? But it can be still full of meaning, right? It can be still full of resonance. It has it, it, it has inbuilt a sort of a, a, a sedimentation of traditions of, of, of human activity. And that's what we need to listen to when we talk about language. And in a sense, that's what Heidegger is saying. Language is, is also, in all of those things, it's a type of listening. And we don't really probably think about that, like, do we? When we say language, when we think of language, we don't think of it, we think somebody says something and we hear it. But we don't actually think of language as trying to attune ourselves to what's really happening or what's really going on or what's, 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 what's really happening. So it is those things, of course, as well. It is, you know, it is, you know, I do, when I say something, I do, shape my mouth and air comes in and out and I breathe through my lungs and, uh, and and noise happens. It is all of those things for sure, but it also contains within it a myriad of human interactions and historical patterns. And all of those are occurring in some way. You know, so like, you know, if we say something, you know, say something banal or trite like, I don't know, a stitch in time saves nine or any of those things. Every time we use those expressions, in some sense they're 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 you know, they're not scientifically true. You know, one swallow doesn't make a summer or any other type of old saying or folk wisdom like that, you know. But when we say them, what do they what do they do? They do show us a sense that we are navigating the world in a way similar to all the way all humans have navigated it before and prior to us. So, in some sense, it puts us in touch with our humanity and all the countless generations and peoples and cultures that have used language to make sense of the world. But also, it was radically new. It's radically new. And in some sense, that's what Heidegger is driving at. That's his positive conception of language, I suppose, that in some way, what is language? Language is profoundly traditional and profoundly radical and innovative at the same time. At the same time. Now, that is a paradox. That is a paradox, if you think about it. How can something be profoundly traditional? And how can something be profoundly radical simultaneously? But that is that is the paradox that Heidegger thinks we need to think through. Indeed, we even need to let it coexist. Why can't we let th those things coexist? You know, in some way, language is profoundly fresh, profoundly new, profoundly reanimating itself and iterating itself across different contexts. But at the same time, it's repeating pre-existing patterns, pre-existing relations, pre-existing concepts and prejudices even. All right? So that is what Heidegger thinks language is. That's how we need to that's what we need to be listening to or need to be attuned to if we want to have an appropriate sense of what the significance of language. The other point I've got there is uh, in terms of Heidegger's positive concept is language is not private. Uh, in some sense, I suppose you've looked at Wittgenstein already this year. Um, Heidegger, at least on this point, Heidegger is in agreement with Wittgenstein, I think. I don't think you can put those two thinkers together it's very easily. I think they've got a lot of great deal, a great huge deal of differences, even the later Wittgenstein. But I think in that sense, they are, they are in agreement that in some sense language is not private, but is in something inherently social. Now, as I said, I was saying in the in the in the podcast, to you, I think Wittgenstein is more of a philosopher of language. It's only a small aspect of Heidegger's thought, but Wittgenstein has a, you know, he's got a more worked out sense of language, to my mind at least. I'm sure some Heideggerians would probably disagree with me, but I think he's got, you know, he's got. It's just a sort of more thorough. I think you know he talks about rule following and private language and languages use and family resemblances and all all of those different things. But I think that's that's what Heidegger is trying to say. So language is something profoundly interactive and transitive and works in, in process. That's what it ought to be articulating, if it is to be meaningful. Also, I say here, language is the doing of it. And that's, a, that's, that's another uh, 
thing that Heidegger is trying to articulate with his, I suppose, his more positive theory, if you like, or his more positive conception of language, that it's language is is the very act of doing it, you know. And again, it's not just it's not just speech, you know. It's not just speech or ostention or describing. It's about our being in the world. It's about our the practical tasks that we that we engage in in order to make it uh, to, 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 to 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 reveal how the world is happening, how the world is occurring in a particular time in a particular space, as it is occurring as it is occurring simultaneously. That's what language is uh, is doing. And the reason I have got a picture there of um I don't know who it is, which, one of the one of the Gallagher's um I think it's Liam. I'm not sure. Whichever one. And in a sense he's communicating there as well, right? And in some sense it's a it's a type of doing that speech act. It's not just a, it's not just a um it's mildly offensive, sure you know, but it's 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 a it's it's an enactment of a of a of, of a role, I suppose. Um, it's a it's a, it's involved as a sort of the practical task of say of being a rock star. And he's not really saying anything per se, is he? He's not you know not speaking, but in another way, he is communicating. It is a form of language, and is the very doing of it is what is important. That's what Heidegger thinks. That's his conception. With again, that's his worry again with neutral language. He thinks neutral language, or you know disinterested technological language is in some way removed is removed from i don't know the rich tapestry of communication the myriad ways we interact with each other are on a daily basis now moving on now again so yeah so there i have a painting uh, it's the tower of babel which is the biblical story from oh which book is it? i think i think it's genesis i think it's genesis actually yeah the tower of babel is in genesis and uh, it's Bruegel's painting of it, um, of the, of the biblical story. Yeah, so it's like a, it's in Genesis, so it's, so it's an origin story. And uh, it's uh, so if I, if I if I recall the story, the idea is that um, humans were trying to, you know, build a, a gateway to the heavens. It was sort of a hubristic act. They were trying to trying to sort of dominate. Um, well. They're trying to trying to make the human immortal, if you like, and uh, and then with the Bible, they, uh, they the story goes they, they try to build a, a tower to the heavens, and uh, I think God is punishment. Um, God is punishment um, for their for the for their for their cheek and chutzpah. He condemned humanity to um, sp speak different languages. That was that's, so. That's kind of the origin story. Is the origin of language, and. The, the 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 in 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 the story then I think everybody just they, they they couldn't talk to each other so that's where we get the word babble from, yeah, um and in a sense that urge I think the reason I was showing you that is I don't think Heidegger particularly talks about that but I think it's a useful way of helping us to understand what Heidegger is getting at, the the story of Babel in the Bible, is one that uh, it reveals what is how language works in some sense language is a kind of a task. Some kind of a perpetual task of translation. Now, I don't mean like scholarly translation, like you know where you're, you know, you're translating French to German or something like that. But the very, very act of, of uh, you know, language is, in, is always, in some sense, about it's a constant renegotiation of where we are in the world. You know, even people in English, you know, when we're when we're when we're when we're interacting with each other. We are in still, in some sense, in a more expansive sense, translating each other. We're picking up for body language cues. We're picking up, um, we're picking up on on inflection, intonation, uh, mood, atmosphere, emotion. And I think that's more what sort of Heidegger is trying to drive at. That's what language is 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 more about. And uh, it's 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 in some sense that is what he's trying to articulate in his theory of language. Languages, I say, they're primordial. He's, it's about the uh, the saying rather than, I suppose, you know, the saying as a form of showing or a saying as a form of revealing or revealing our historicity as I, 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 I said it already. Language is, is always our master. We don't own language. And I think that's what the, the quote I had at the beginning was that I was trying to trying to articulate. I think an example of that might be something like well, you know, when you're, I don't know, say if you're saying you have a good time at a party or something like that, you know, you sort of lose sense of time and things like that, and you're having a, a really good, deep, meaningful conversation with somebody, 
that is is and, and in some sense you're trying to, you're trying to work the big things out and ultimately you know you don't really you know it's not really instrumental it's not useful you know nothing gets solved you know you might i don't know go to the pub have a few beers you start talking about politics you set the world to rights and you know it's not like you change the dimension of power indeed it might even have a cathartic uh, dimension you don't change the political situation by talking through it but uh, is valuable be precisely because it is useless, you know, for Heidegger. It is, runs counter to the in, in, instrumental language. It's precisely valuable because it engenders a sense of reciprocity, mutual recognition, and a sense of dialogue, all right? And, you know, dialogue is a valuable world there. The dialogue is, you know, dialogos, or like sort of two languages or two tongues, and it's that sense of interactivity, that's what language does. That's what language is about. You know, language is not something stored inside us, which we reanimate, you know, when we think about it anytime we meet somebody. Language is the very process of that interactivity. It's a, it is the ebb and flow. It is the back and forth. It is the cut and trust of real speech, real life situations. That's what Heidegger is talking about. And, um, yeah, so moving on then, I, I guess... So I'm going to just talk about a few uh, a few more points quickly because uh, I want to sort of draw things to a close. But in some sense, language is that, that kind of language that Heidegger was talking about has has a it's got a, a saving power. It's got a therapeutic dimension. It's one of the reasons why why people get lonely. Is you know why what's the very basic reason people get lonely? They've got nobody to talk to. You know, and in some sense, if you've got no one to talk to, you become lonely. You are. In some sense, you feel at least removed from humanity. You are removed from the task, the destiny of, 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 of human beings. You feel as if you are not valuable in some sense. And that's what I guess Heidegger is saying, is that we need to think about language in that way as offering, a, 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 I suppose, a therapeutic dimension. It is something that, that, that you know, it puts us in contact with human destinies as unfolding. I mean, that in the sort of the grand sense, you know, what's happening to all humans. I mean, we're seeing it at the moment with the um, with the COVID nineteen crisis. You know, people are grappling and grasping new ways to try and communicate with each other as people are become more and more atomized and separate. But what language does, I think, you know, what language does is it 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 that type of authentic language, the language which is a appropriate or a portion to an understanding of our being or our historicity is that it manifests possibilities for us you know it manifests possibilities for us i mean basically that's what the you know in, in counseling that's why why people t that's why we have the talking cure you know if you go to counseling you have a, a lack of sense of possibilities your sense of possibilities are diminished in your life and in some sense that's what uh, a therapeutic encounter in a counseling session say if you're with a therapist or something like that that's what it does it it opens up possibilities and alternatives rather than existing in a sense uh, in a, just in a, 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 in a sense where you just consider yourself as an object where you can become nothing 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 else right and in a and in another sense as well as all that Heidegger says that what language does is what, or what the work it's doing is is revealing our relationship well to nature to our world in the nature of the broadest possible sense, not just sort of biological nature. It reveals our 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 embeddedness in the world in which we are in. And we move we we, we, we forget that and we set back. You know, I don't know, when we're engaged in writing emails or writing text messages and when we're you know, I don't know, when we're on Skype or on MS Teams as we will be soon, in some sense that we are removed from actual encounters real encounters and again now i'm not saying that you know i don't think Heidegger would go so far as to say something like a skype conversation or an ms teams conversation like we'll probably have in the next couple of days would be would be would be in some way authentic but it's 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 it would it would it would the, the medium would be a supplement right or a sort of prosthetic if you like rather than the actual encounter right but i suppose what heidegger is worried about is that we just take the medium or the technology for what they for what language uh, does or can do 
So in a sense, language is, has a sort of a, a language is connected to freedom, I think, for Heidegger, or openness. In some sense, if you have, you know, uh, th- you know, we might not think that. You might not think that because we're, you know, we have free speech and we all think it's very important, perhaps. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we talk all the time. We engage in chatter. And in some sense, uh, language, that is important, you know, that we have that. Language enables possibilities, enables the sense that we can become other than we are. And we take that for granted, I think, for Heidegger. That's the problem. Language enables freedom. We take it for granted, though. You know, if you think about it, one of the first things you do if you're imprisoned, or you know, if you're you're you lose your sense of voice, you know, you, you know, how many people? So, I say, take for example, people who are in prisons at the moment. Do we know what they're saying about the COVID crisis? Do we know how they're affected by it? Are they affected more by it? No, because. That's one of the things we do. We take away a person's voice, which is a very, very profound, uh, a very, very profound, um, a profoundly sort of coercive and oppressive thing to do, to take away a person's ability to speak. Because if you take away a person's ability to speak, you take away their humanity. You take away their ability to relate. You take away their ability to overcome isolation. So that's why language is something hugely important for Heidegger. And he's concerned about the fact that we have... Uh, for 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 forgotten about it is because it's intimate uh, language is intimately linked with a human sense of possibility it's a sense of what it can and cannot do or what or to problems it might or might not be able to 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 overcome and i suppose that's the broader concern for heidegger is that you know if language becomes more and more technological it becomes more and more nihilistic and if it becomes more and more nihilistic language loses its sense of place everything becomes amorphous as i say there in the slide and again that's the nihilistic notion language doesn't say anything of value in that situation language is leveled hollowed out meaningless and we need to try and reclaim that for heidegger or or what he says there the sense of distanceless distance distanceless that should be probably i'll just change that while i'm here distancelessness if that, if that works um, I guess the point I'm trying to drive at there is that formulaic language empty language language that does not reveal a world it proliferates a sense of uh, uh, it, it, it proliferates a lack of a sense of place right you know you know, to have a sense of distance is, is also to have a sense of where you are and where you're going a sense of how the language you are doing is embedded in the world. And that's why Heidegger is talking about, you know, trying to understand the tradition, the, the, the roots and origins and the indebtedness of language that we have to the past, but also to try to understand the creative capacities of language, the inventive capacities, the flexible la- capacities of language. Because if we don't understand that, we have to, we, we, we will not be at home in the world. We will not, you know, ask questions of meaning or, or, or try to find meaningful questions where we can dwell at ease in the world or at home in the world in some sense, which is what ultimately, for Heidegger, what we're all looking for. We're all looking for belonging in some sense and that's why belonging, that's about a question of living and that's why for Heidegger, poetically man dwells and language is the house of being. Now, to summarise before I conclude, um what am I been saying today? So for Heidegger, the core points are Heidegger's concerned about the mechanization of language. He's thinking language is becoming more and more homogenous and therefore it is becoming less meaningful. And as that's interesting, you know, why might language be meaningless given that, uh, you know, the whole job of language is, uh, is to express things. But I think Heidegger is saying is that, you know, it's easy to talk. Talk is cheap, but language uh, is there to try and reveal things which are significant for us. Uh, so in a sense, we're losing our me- uh, a meaningful understanding of language. And what Heidegger wants to do, you know, alternatively, is try and understand language that is proximate to the question of being. And then that's proximate to the question of our historicity. It's more broader, it's more connected, ought to be more connected to broader questions of fate and meaning and the direction of humanity uh, in, 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 in general. And Heidegger 
is concerned that the technologization of language, it leads to kind of the logicization of language or the idea that language is, we, 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 is becoming scientific. Well, not scientific, well, pseudo-scientific. Language becomes inflected with sort of the language of uh, science and technology. And that is an effect of modern technology for Heidegger. Uh, language becomes infected and reduced to the economic, the corporate or technological terms. And for Heidegger, that's broadly indicative of a wider nihilistic malaise. On the, in opposition then, Heidegger tries to understand language as more meaningful. Uh, he wants to try and understand language as concrete. He wants to understand language as something that's inherently social. And for Heidegger, what language is, is, is kind of a nexus between the past and the future and the present. For Heidegger, the language we inhabit, we are thrown into, tradition, into traditions, I guess, and language practices, and these practices guide what is possible. However, at one and the same time, they also reanimate themselves in newer contexts. And that is what Heidegger is driving at when he says that, you know, Dysbrachsbrick, that language speaks us rather than us speaking language. Language is not something that we ultimately own. It's not inaugurated within the psychological contact of our minds, sorry, the psychological content rather. Uh, it's almost like language is, um, has a purpose of its own or a life of its own or it animates itself in, in different ways. So language is at once deeply traditional, yet also something deeply new and radical. Right? Um, I think a really sort of good example of that would be, you know, in English we use, we add the word ish at the end of things. Um, ish, like, you know, you say something is like bluish or reddish. So like, like when we add the word ish at the end of the word to express the concept within a wider range of reference. So we use the word bluish for something that is kind of blue, but not quite blue. And I think that would be a good example of how, sort of how Heidegger is driving at with, uh, with, 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 with language. It's something, you know... We have the concept or definition of blue, but it's only f meaningful to the sense that it can be reanimated. It's only meaningful in the sense that there is a nexus between the past, the tradition, the definition, and how it reanimates itself in uh, newer contexts. And that's what that's sort of what what language is for Heidegger. I think it's it is something that's iterable. You know, that means it can be repeated, and it has the capacity to be. But it's iterable but at the same time is profoundly uh, innovative. Language has the capacity to reanimate it in new contexts, whilst at the same time remaining sensitive to the patterns and linguistic traditions and intonations and idioms and traditions and rules that govern it. And I think if you can try and understand that, then, then that, if you can understand that notion of language, for Heidegger, the idea that language is at once profoundly traditional and profoundly new simultaneously, you'll be well on the way to understanding what he means by language. Okay, I'll leave it there. Goodbye, everybody.